morning, Cross Point. It's good to see you all here. Hope you're all excited. God is awesome. And I'll just tell you how awesome he is. I got to spend the last few days over at Port Aransas Beach. God, God speaks to you at the beach, brother. I, I'm just telling you. There is nothing wrong with going to the beach. I absolutely love it. Well, I hope everybody else had a, had a great week. I hope you're energized and ready to go. We are going to be starting a new series this morning entitled Getting Real. Getting Real. And we're going to get real with some things in our life and with our spiritual life. And in, some of it's going to be uh, challenging. Some of it's going to be the uh, aha. Some of it's going to be, I really got to do that. And some of it's going to be, oh, I do do that. So it's all going to be good. Y'all are so excited this morning. <laughs> I, 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 sm- I, can, I can get the little, and I'm excited, but I'm also a little scared. But it's gonna, I, I promise you, it's not going to hurt a whole lot. Just a little lot. Okay. In, the, in this series, uh, week two, we are going to talk about getting real about where we are with Jesus. And week three, we're going to talk about getting real in who you are with Jesus. And then we're going to talk about getting real with your prayer life in week four. And week five, we're going to finish the series out with getting real about your spiritual principles of life. All right? So I hope you're excited about that. There's a lot. I mean, we're going to get into some good scripture, and it's going to be good stuff. So in order to start this series off, though, we are going to go to our key scripture here, Hebrews 10, 22 through 23. And it says this, let us draw near to God with a sincere, sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. It's a great scripture. And there's so much we're going to pull from this scripture in these five weeks. It's a whole lot. But I love the first part because I really believe that when it says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, he's talking about getting real with God. He's talking. He's saying, I want you to get real about who you are with me. Don't play a game. Don't, don't, don't play the Christian game. Don't play a religious game. But let's get real together. Because you can, you can, there's lots of great prayers that you can pray to me, but I don't want to just hear great prayers. I want to hear heart prayers. I want to hear th- issues that are going on in your life, issues from your heart. That's what I want to hear. And for the last six years, I have been able to talk to young adults every week. And we have so, oh, such a wide range of young adults that come to our Tuesday night meeting. And here's, what, here's the number one thing that they tell us, the, the number one comment that we get. I, I was hurt in the church and I walked away. Why did you walk away? Because people aren't who they say they are. Because people who aren't, they're not who they say they are. But every time they come here, here's the number one comment when they leave. I feel safe. I feel safe. I feel safe. That's what we want here as the church as a whole. We want people people to come in here, no matter what issues they have going on in their life, we want them leaving feeling safe. Not just because of how great we are and how loving we are, which we need to be, but how great we reflect Jesus. We have to reflect Jesus. We're not going to be perfect, and you know what? We have to be real about that. It's okay to tell someone, yeah, I'm not perfect either. I've made lots of mistakes. I tell that to my wife on a daily basis. Actually, that's not true. She tells me that on a regular basis about me. (laughs) But here's what I believe God is wanting us to be. A bunch of imperfect people coming together under the blood of Christ to be authentic reconcilers to the lost and brokenhearted. 
That's who we're, that's, you want a purpose statement? There it is. There's not one person in this room that can say, I've lived a perfect life. There's not one person here that can say, hey, in order to be a Christian, you have to be perfect. It doesn't work that way. In order to be a Christian, you just have to know I once was lost. But now I'm, some of you got that and some of you didn't, okay? What? I once was lost, but now I'm, okay, all right. Come on, I know it's early. Come on, let's, let's get warm up. It's all good. All right, last week y'all all fanning yourselves because we had an air conditioner down. This week you're all like, oh, it's too cold. The only way to warm yourselves up is to get active, all right? Here we go. Here we go. We have to be real with people about their struggles and victories so that they can be honest about their struggles and victories. I want to be honest about everything that goes on. Because I believe this. I believe the, that God accept, accepts us exactly where we are, but loves us too much to leave us there. He loves us too much. He's going to accept us exactly as we are. I love you. I don't care what you look like. Just come to me. Call on my name. I don't care what you've done. I'm going to love you but I'm going to love you so much that you can't remain the same. I'm going to give you a new purpose. I'm going to give you a new dream. Our message this morning is entitled, Getting Real with Our Dreams. And getting real with our dreams, that means we have to be really honest with God about what his dreams are for us, not just what our dreams are for ourselves. And we have to be very careful about that. Because we all have dreams and we all have things that we want to accomplish. But is it for our glory or for his glory? And we have, to, we have to be honest about this. Just a few years ago, uh, seven years ago, God put this huge dream in Andrea and I's heart. And people, I had people come up to me throughout the entire time I've been a pastor and say, Someday you're going to be a senior pastor. Someday you're going to be a lead pastor. Someday you're going to be a lead pastor. And, and I was just like, no, that's not for me. I'm good. I don't need that. And I don't need it. But it was a dream that God stirred in my heart. And there were days where I'd be like, you know what? I think that we can do this. And seven years ago, we were at a church, and the whole church just imploded. I mean, it just went south bad. It was just a horrible ordeal we had great friends that came out of that horrible ordeal but it was it was very rough and we we got hurt really bad we got stabbed in the back it was hard it's a hard situation but I my whole tendency was I'm going to stay and I'm going to fight and I'm going to fight and I'm going to fight because that's what I do I don't back away I don't like to run away I like to stand my ground I like to push forward and I said God this is what I'm going to do and he said, that's not what I want you to do. I said, God, this is what you've taught me to do, to stand and fight and move forward. That's not what I want you to do, John. God, but this is what I'm going to do, God, because I know what's best. I've been, you know, I went to Bible school for a little while, and I know what's going on. <laughs> and God's like, John, that's not what I, wanna, what I want you to do. Well, God, maybe you should go to Bible school for a little bit and know what's going on. Because this is what I've been taught, and this is what, I, this is what I, I know to do. And he said, John, I don't want you to do that. I said, but Lord, I have a family that I have to take care of. I have all these things. And Lord, you've promised me these dreams. Yes, I have. So we have to stand forward. We have to stand firm and move forward. He's like, but not here. So I got really, really sick, and I, I was just, it was basically just me wrestling with God. And I got really, really ill. And, I mean, I could barely walk from my bedroom to my living room. It was, just, I was miserable for days. Running fever, and I just thought it was cold, but it just kept lasting. I couldn't break it. And then finally, I just woke up about 3 o'clock in the morning, and I stumbled into my living room. And I got on my knees, and I said, Lord, if you want me to leave, I need you to tell me through Scripture. And... So I grabbed my Bible, and I laid it, put it right in front of me, and I opened it. The first thing I opened it to was Genesis 12. 
where it says leave, leave your country, leave all that you know. And I was like, okay, all right, then that's what I'm supposed to do. I said, all right, Lord, I'm making this commitment. I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave and I'm going to, I'm going to go with your dream and not my own. And he said, good. I'm telling you, I went to bed. I woke up at about 8 o'clock the next morning, perfectly healed. I wasn't sick. I didn't have any. My stomach wasn't upset. I wasn't running fever. Everything was gone. And I said, Andrea, it's time to write our resignation. This is what God's told us to do. And she said, okay. She didn't fight about it. She didn't do anything. She said, okay. I said, this is the dream that God gave me. Okay, I believe in it. So we did it. And then you think, okay, we did our resignation, and I put my resume out there, and I was like, man, I'll get hired quick. No problem. I got a great resume. I'll get hired by anybody. It'd be This will be fast. Now. Let me tell you, that was the hardest period of our married life. It really was. It was a struggle. One month went by, the Lord's just testing us, it's all good. Babe, we're, we're going to hold on to his promises. We're going to hold on to the dreams he's given us. Week two, uh, month two went by, no job. Neither one of us, because we both worked at the church. So neither one of us had jobs. Month number three comes by, our savings are gone. We got to start making some money and paying bills. That mortgage is creeping up on us. So here I am going door to door asking if I can mow people's lawn because we got to make some money. So we have, a, we have to do whatever it takes. My wife started working at a bakery with her friend just to do whatever it took. I was traveling from... Groundwood to San Marcos, working for my dad, trying to work as an electrician, doing, doing different jobs, whatever he needed me to do. And after the third month, I started going, did I hear you, God? What was that promise you gave? Lord, this isn't what you promised. Then month four went by. Month five went by. Month six went by. No job. I'd had interviews. And I'd gone to speak at a couple places, but nothing. And I had a breakdown moment. I had a breakdown moment in a parking lot at Garden Reach Pottery in New Braunfels, and I just lost it. I was sitting in my car, Andrew was next to me, and I was just, that's it. And we got we we talked and we prayed. And I was like, God, where's that dream that you gave me? Where is that dream? And all I kept hearing was, be patient. Oh, don't you hate it when God says that? <laughs> be patient. Be patient. It's coming. Then the next month, we start going through periods where my wife would be really up here and I'd be here. And then we'd switch. And she'd be really here and I'd be up here. Babe, we can do it. We can do it. God's He's got this. Month seven. Nothing. And all of a sudden, we're, neither one of us are alternating anymore. We're about here. It was a tough time. I mean, we're barely making it. I mean, only by the act of God did we not lose our house. I mean, I was like, they're going to start coming for our kids. Which one do you want to give up? <laughs> I wasn't thinking about that, but your mom was. I'm, I'm just saying. <laughs> but it, we got low. We got low. I mean, I'm sitting here. I'm watching all my friends, everybody that we were in pastorship with. They're all getting jobs. They're all pastoring somewhere. They're all going to the one place to the other. And they're all, it's like. What is going on? And then I thought, I'm going to be spiritual. I'm going to rejoice that they are happy. 
I'm going to rejoice that they have jobs. Lord, I rejoice. I thank you, that, Lord, that you have answered their prayers. Month number eight. No job. Lord, why didn't I get their job? <laughs> it was crazy. But throughout the whole time, we kept having people call us and text us and encourage us and say, your dreams are going to come true. The dreams that God gave you are going to come true. I don't know. I don't see it. I felt like our dreams were dead. Month 9 and 10 were really the darkest. We had no income. We had no income. It was hard. My business with my dad had dried up a little bit. He couldn't, he couldn't keep driving me down. You know, it was getting to the point where it was so hot in Texas that nobody needed their yards mowed anymore. Like right now. It was hard. I was looking for anything. Walmart wouldn't hire me. They said, you're overqualified to put stuff on a shelf. It was crazy. I thought, this dream is dead. This dream is dead. And I'm here to tell you, this is what God wants you to know if you're struggling with dreams from him. God wants you to dream again. Because he's going to resurrect your dreams if you'll let him. God wants you to dream again. How do you know? We just read it earlier in Hebrews. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. Full assurance that faith brings. See, when we have faith in God's dreams, then those dreams will awaken us inside. There is something inside of us that will awaken and give us purpose and direction. It will inspire us. When we have full assurance that God's not going to let me go, he's given me a dream. This is what the dream is. And you, we, we strive for that dream. We push forward with that dream. But there are times when we get so low, we, we start, start saying, no, that dream's dead. And God says, no, dream again. Because my dreams always come true. Full assurance. If you look at Abraham, and I told you, we went to Genesis 12. It says this, the Lord said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. Here's one, here's one thing that I learned that was very strong. When it comes to your dreams, they're not, if they're really from God, they're really not your dreams. They're God's dreams for you. And I, the whole time I, we were going through this, Lord, how can I do this? How can I do this? How can I do this? And he took me back to the scripture. He took me back to Genesis 12. And he says, remember it was the land I will show you? I will make you. I will bless you. You just have to hold on to the dream. Just go through it. Just have faith. When Abraham was 75 years old, a dream awakened inside of him to leave a nation. When he was 100 years old, another dream awakened inside of him. And God told him, you're going to have a son. Your wife is going to have a son. Yes, you're 100, she's 91. But you're going to have a son. Kind of gross when you think about it. It would be really hard. Can you imagine Moses, I mean, Abraham's going, no, nope, that's not going to happen. <laughs> but it did. It did. Why? Because dreams from God don't die. They don't die. We're the ones that let them go. And we have to be careful. Dreams give us encouragement. They give us hope. And they give us something to strive for. So how do we activate our dreams? How do we activate our daily dreams? 
our yearly dreams, our life dreams. Number one is this, be sincere in your approach to God. Be sincere in your approach to God. Ask him for his dreams for you. But Lord, this is what I want. This is what I want. And it's my will. I will do this. I will do this. It's not just about what we want. It's about what he wants. And when I got that, and I finally understood that, things were a whole lot calmer at my house. Not because my wife lost faith, because I had lost it. And when I realized that, Lord, these are your dreams. These aren't my dreams. I'm going to trust that you will. Things started changing. Things started happening. Ask him for his dreams for you. Our dreams will come and go, but God's dreams will prove to be everlasting. Acts 2.17 says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. What is he doing? He's resurrecting visions and dreams in people's lives. That is a story of resurrection right there. That is a story of, of, of a building up and encouraging of a restoration. God is wanting to resurrect dreams inside of you. I have a dream of being a great singer. Good. That is awesome. But you got to put the work in. I have a dream of being, uh, of, of leading a, and being a lead pastor because you gave it to me. Well, I had to put the work in. It doesn't just come. You have to put the work in. I believe that the number one deterrent to op- approaching God, and this is because I've been there. The number one deterrent to approaching God to receive your dream is this, shame and guilt. Because I felt shame that I, I told my wife this is what God said and it wasn't coming. I told my wife, I told my family, this is what God has told me. And by month nine, I wasn't sure if I heard the right thing or not. And I was, I was so full of shame and guilt that the dream inside of me began to die. Shame and guilt are dream stealers. Proverbs 13, 19 says, It is pleasant to see dreams come true, but fools refuse to turn from evil to attain them. It is pleasant to see dreams come true. But I don't want to be that fool again. Because you may say, well, John, you didn't do anything evil. I doubted God. And that leads to a place of evil. Because once you allow doubt to creep in, you will start to allow other things to creep in. And that leads away from God. And anything that leads away from God is evil. I hope you get that. Anything that pulls you away from God, God will never separate from you. But there are things that we allow to pull us from him. And we have to be careful. When we feel condemnation, shame, and guilt, that is not from God. That is from Satan. Conviction is from the Holy Spirit. Condemnation is from Satan. There is not one person that I believe will walk through these doors and feel condemnation from anyone in this church. And if they do, you just direct me to the person who did the condemning. Because that's not who we're going to be. We're going to love people. When we feel completely beaten and broken down, it's usually because condemnation has taken the place of God's dreams for your life. Anybody ever felt beaten and broken down? And in that moment, did you feel some condemnation coming over you? Don't let anything take the place of God's dreams for you. Don't allow the enemy to steal your dreams. He doesn't deserve them. Those are for you, not for him. Don't let him come in and steal your dreams. 
Don't let him do it. And here's the deal. We're the ones that allow him. We think that we, he just came in and stole them. But that's not the truth. We have allowed him to come in and take them. Because we let doubt come in. We let condemnation come in. We let shame and guilt come in. We're the ones that do it. He has no authority over you. You have Jesus inside of you. Don't allow, don't allow the enemy to steal your dreams. What happens if our heart is no longer sincere? I love this part of Hebrews 10. It answers what we, with these thoughts that we have. What happens if our heart is no longer sincere? What happens if we lose our dreams? What happens if we've fallen away? Hebrews 10, says, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. Sprinkled with what? The blood of Jesus. That's what he sprinkled us with. To cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. What happens then? You're cleansed. And guess what? You can come back. Your dreams can't come back. They will come back. You can come back from anything that the enemy has, from any plan that he has for you. If he's trying to steal your dreams, you can tell him, no, no more. Those are mine. God gave them to me, and I'm not letting go. And that's what we had to do. We had to come together, and we had to, as a married couple, we had to come together and say, the enemy's not stealing our dreams anymore. And we had to encourage each other. We had to build each other up. And we had to depend that it wasn't just our will, but it was God's will that was going to take care of us. He will take us. He will guide us. He will direct us. You can come back. The whole Bible is full of great illustrations. Jonah deliberately ran from God. But he came back. Jacob was a liar. Gideon was afraid. Moses was a murderer, and God used him. Rahab was a prostitute, and Samson really liked prostitutes. In the biblical sense. David was an adulterer and a murderer. Elijah was suicidal. Just kill me now, God. This is not going the way I thought. Just take me now. I am done. Just kill me. I, I can't do this anymore. Elijah, the prophet, he's like, I'm giving up. I'm done. I got nothing left. Peter denied Jesus. Thomas was too negative. Zacchaeus was too small. Paul was too religious. Lazarus was too dead. <laughs> Lazarus was too dead. And after three days, even Jesus used him. He, there, he was stinking in the grave, rotting away. And Jesus said, no, I'm not done with you yet. I'm about to resurrect my dream in Lazarus. So here's a question. What's your excuse? What's your excuse for letting the dreams die? What's your excuse for not allowing God to fulfill those dreams inside of you? What's your excuse? Are you telling me that what is sprinkled and makes us clean, that Jesus' blood isn't good enough for you? It's good enough for me. I promise you it's good enough for me. Once again, how do we activate our dreams? Number two, we're going to go through this. Number two is be sincere in your declaration of dreams. Be sincere in your declaration of dreams. Dream for God. And let him know it. Declare it to him. This is the dream you've given me. I am not letting go. And if it's not of God, it will naturally fade away. But if it's of God, there will be a passion that stirs inside of you that cannot die. It can't die. Mark 10 is a great story. Of blind Bartimaeus, all right? We're going to call him Bart for short, all right? Because I'm going to say his name a lot, and it's just going to take time. Verse 46 says, 
Then they reached Jericho, and as Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him. A blind beggar named Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was sitting beside the road. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, I love this because this man who is blind, you know he's blind, you know he's been sitting there a while, and you know that people know who he is. He's recognized. But blind Bart, Bart, okay, he had a dream to see. He had a dream to see. It doesn't say if he saw before. There's not a whole lot of backstory. But he had a dream to see. I want to see. And if anybody, well, from what I have heard, if anybody can help me to see, it's that man. I want to see. I have a dream to be able to just see with my own eyes. I want to see this world. And this is what he did. He began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. I'm going to shout. Then verse 48 says, be quiet. Many of the people yelled at him. They told him to be quiet. And then he does this. says, but he only shouted louder. Be quiet. Shut up. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. That's what he did. He shouted louder. He had a dream. The enemy told him to be quiet. He shouted louder. He had a spiritual insight into who Jesus was. Nobody was going to steal his dream from him about seeing When Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, tell him to come here. I love it when Jesus says, come here. You know that? Isn't it good to hear Jesus say, come here? Come here. Tell him to come here. He didn't even address him by his name. He could have. He just said, tell him to come here. Because everybody knew who was causing the ruckus. So they called to the blind man. They said, cheer up. Come on, he's calling you. Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Do you really think Jesus had to ask? Do you think Jesus had to ask him? I'm sure Jesus knew. I'm sure when Jesus walked into the area, into Jericho, he knew exactly who he was going to meet. He knew what was going to happen. He could have called him by name, but he didn't this time. Others he's called by name, but but Bart, he didn't. Why? This is why. This is what I believe. It says, Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked. It says, my rabbi, the blind man said, I want to see. There are dreams that are inside of you that have been given to you by God. But you've allowed the enemy to come in here and take, take them away, to try to steal them. And with that, there's been a little bit of your fire and your zeal for God that has left. And I'm here to tell you this morning, it's time to resurrect those dreams. It's time to let God do what we think is impossible. It's time to allow Jesus to come in and do something new and exciting in your life. And it's time for your dreams to resurrect in Jesus' name. It's time for that zeal to come back. Cheer up. He's calling you. Cheer up. If you're down right now, cheer up. He's calling you this morning. You don't understand what I've been through. I don't. I know what we went through. And I know the moment that we began shouting and declaring that Jesus is Lord and and that our dreams were going to come to pass, we got a job. And that job was here. It didn't take hardly any time after that. But we had to go through a valley and we had to learn. And I'll tell you this, people are like, would you trade that? Nope. I don't want to go through it again, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. I wouldn't trade it. Because my wife, we were, we were close together. But man, that took us to a new place with God in our relationship. And I will never give that away. Cheer up. What do you want me to do? 
Jesus wanted him to say, I want to see. What is inside of you that you want Jesus to do? What is inside of you? What's that dream inside of you that you want Jesus to do? Because here's the, what, what's going to happen. If we do it because of God's dreams, if we do it because of him and his glory, he says, go, for your faith has healed you. And instantly the man could see. Maybe there's a dream inside of you that you haven't been able to see for a long time. And I'm going to tell you, go, if your faith, if, if you can build up your faith and you can believe that Jesus is going to heal you this morning, you can leave here with that dream being full in your vision. It can happen. But it won't happen unless we say, now. I'm going to ask our worship team to come up. Jesus is asking us, what do you want me to do for you? And I'm going to ask that you declare what the enemy is trying to shut you up to do. I want you to declare that your dream is alive. And if you have to shout louder, shout louder. I'm not a shouting type person. <laughs> if you're not here and you go to heaven, you're going to be. <laughs> well, that's when I get to heaven. Oh, but practice here is so good. When we worship here, we have to sing loud. Because it can be loud in heaven. And I believe that when we sing loud and we worship loud and we worship with everything we have, oh my goodness, his presence just comes on so thick because he says, those are my people. They all have dreams. And I'm ready to see those dreams come to pass. I'm here to resurrect those dreams. I'm here to sell them. Your faith has healed you. Your faith has healed you. Jesus is not done with you. He is not done with either, any of you. If your dreams have died, today is the time to ask Jesus to resurrect them. If there's something in you that says, I just want to see him again, you're going to see him. Go. For your faith has healed you. Before you leave here, I want you to be able to hear that in your heart. I'm going to ask our prayer team to come. And we're going to spend time praying with you. And for our prayer team, once you're done praying with other people, if you need prayer, then don't leave here without praying for one another. Because even those that are on the prayer team need to be prayed for. So as we I'm going to pray, and we're going to sing a worship song. And I'm just going to be bold. Be, this guy was blind. He was bold. He could have just been quiet. He could have listened to everybody, but he didn't. He shouted louder. Your shout could be you just walking up and declaring, I need help. I want my dream to be resurrected. Don't sit down. Don't wait. Let God do something amazing this morning. And leave here knowing that you have been healed. Lord God, we just thank you. We praise you. We honor you this morning. And we say, come, Lord Jesus, and heal us, Lord God. Resurrect our dreams, Lord God. And let's be able to be real with you so that we can have a real encounter, a real time with you. And we're going to be real about our desire, our dreams, our hopes in Jesus' name. And, Lord, I know that you're going to be real with us. So, Lord, I ask that you would just open up our eyes in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. If you need prayer, come now. Don't wait, just come.
and your will be done. Oh, our Father. He's a great dad. He's a great dad. And if there are dreams inside of you, and God's given them to you, I believe they're going to come to pass. In fact, I speak that over you in Jesus' name. His dreams will come to pass. You may have to go through some valleys, but you may have to go through some hard times, but I promise you, the louder we shout, the closer those dreams get. The more we hold on to our faith in Him, those dreams will come. I believe in my I believe in the healing power of Jesus. And I believe that His promises are true. Lord God, just be with all of us throughout the week. Protect everyone. Keep everyone healthy and safe. And Lord, help us to make a difference in the lives that you allow us to encounter. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Have a fantastic week. We will see you here next week. Go out and make a difference for the kingdom of God this week.